Restaurant Unstoppable. Inspire, empower, and transform the industry. With excitement, allow me to welcome back on the show for a third consecutive time, Stephanie Robson. Stephanie, are you feeling unstoppable today? <laughs> Eric, I am so unstoppable. I need a runaway truck ramp to slow <laughs> you down. Yeah, so this is our third session uh, of the business planning a uh, three-part series workshop. I don't know what we're calling it, uh, but I highly recommend if you have not listened to those first two sessions, you hit pause right now, you go back to part one and part two, which are every other episode before this one. If you're looking on the uh, list of episodes on iTunes or wherever you're playing this, you get caught up. And what we're actually following the restaurantowner.com template, their business plan template. So if uh, you're not, a member of restaurantowner.com yet, I highly recommend you go over there and you subscribe or you come join Restaurant Unstoppable Network and you'll get six months free access to restaurantowner.com. And uh, we're using those resources as our guide. So that's why it's kind of important. So with that said, I think I can pass it over to you now, Stephanie, or is there anything I missed? No, I, I think we're good to go. I hope everybody has something to take notes with. Um, or if you have the, the uh, template open, by all means, work along with us. Um, and questions are good because there's a lot of content here. Last time we talked about the, the figuring out how much your sales need to be. And there were a lot of sort of nuances to that. And today we're going to talk about figuring how much your concept costs and how to put that together in the model. That also is going to generate some questions. So please, if you've got questions and if you're listening yeah. along live, let us know. And I think I could have set that up a little bit better. The first session part one was all about who to write your business plan for. Part two was all about pro forma. I really recommend you watch the video with that one because there was a lot of screen sharing going on in that episode. And today we're very geeky. Yeah. Very geeky. Today we're going to go over capital budgeting. So with that said, I think we can officially kick it off. Go for it. All right. So the the question a lot of people have when they move to a bricks and mortar is how much is this going to cost me, right? How much do I spend to create the restaurant? And the term capital budget, a lot of people go, oh, what is that? It just means the money you spend until the day you open, really. That's your capital budget. And the problem with the capital budget is there's only one good answer, which is it depends. It depends on a lot. But I will tell you that most people grossly underestimate how much capital they're going to need to open. And you hear stories of people opening a restaurant on a shoestring and, oh, you know, I did it for $15,000 and I just used a lot of sweat equity. You're probably going to be very, very unlikely to open anything for $15,000. Um, but what I do want to show you today and walk you through is the capital budget part of the restaurantowner.com model. Talk through some of the categories of information that you need to fill it out correctly. And the reason you want to fill it out correctly is it helps you figure out those key things that your potential investors are gonna care about, right? Return on investment, payback period, but it also helps you kind of work on your concept a little bit more because as you're filling in the capital budget, you might have to start thinking about things that you haven't put a lot of thought to yet, but you're gonna to have to decide before you move ahead. So even though you might be quite a long way from building out a restaurant, I think you need to spend some time with the capital budget now just to see the kinds of information you need to find. Okay. Yeah. And I think um, if you guys have not caught episode 802, uh, we connected with Ken Schwartz, uh, who did, we did a workshop together on how to ramp up for financial sustainability. I think that's going to be a really good co-episode. If you're, if you're, if you're listening to this one and you're searching for content like this, also listen to that one, because I think that will also serve you really well. Thank you for letting me chime in there, Stephanie. Keep oh, going. Absolutely. Chime on in on whatever, whatever you want to jump in on, Eric. Um, I am going to share my screen, and I am pulling up the restaurantowner.com financial model, the one that was posted about a week or so ago. It's the most up-to-date one. And I'm bringing up the page that is the capital budget. So just to refresh your memory, this is a model that has a whole bunch of tabs in it because there's a lot of stuff that you need to address when you're putting together a business plan for a restaurant. And the tab that I'm focusing on is actually pretty early on in the model, uh, but that's because this information then is used later on in the model to do some calculations of ROI and so on. 
Um, so the capital budget, the, the example I've pulled up is actually the filled in version of the model. On restaurantowner.com, you'll see a template, which is the blank version. But there's also something called sample, which is the filled in version. And the filled in just gives you an idea. And I think it's nice to have that open or work with it when you're filling in your own template. So I've got the sample open here and it's open to the page called capital budget. So hopefully everybody's along here with me. Now, there's a lot of stuff that you start with a restaurant, but most of you will not start with a piece of real estate that you own. Now, you might, you might own a building and you decide you're gonna put a restaurant in it. And that's great. Um, if you have the building, that's an asset that's always gonna serve you well. But most people, when they start a restaurant or other kind of food business are leasing space rather than going into space that they own. So the first thing this capital budget is doing is making that distinction between real estate, which is the actual asset that you are purchasing, land and building, and leasehold improvements, which is space that somebody else owns and you're moving into it and you're making whatever changes you need to for your restaurant. So in your capital budget for many people under real estate, you just wanna put zero because you probably are not buying land. You're probably not buying a building or building a building on land that you've purchased. Fair enough. So it says zero here in the sample, but under leasehold improvements, this is where you would put in just what you would spend on what I'm gonna call the building guts. <laughs> By that, I mean walls, floors, ceilings, doors, windows, and the, the systems inside. So plumbing, electrical, uh, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, otherwise known as HVAC or HVAC, um, gas lines, that kind of stuff. That typically is considered leasehold improvements because that stuff stays in the building. So when you decide your restaurant is too small and you need to move to a bigger space or you decide to, to change it to some other form, that material that's in leasehold improvements stays with the building. Now, you might say, well, if I'm making these changes to a building, the landlord's benefiting, right? They're getting the value of this new gas line or this new electrical system, the stuff that I'm putting in. So should the landlord be paying for this stuff? <laughs> well, in theory, yes, but most landlords will not pay for all of that. Um, if you are lucky, the landlord will give you a chunk of change to help mitigate some of those costs because it's things that stay with the building. So it's not unusual for there to be a landlord contribution. Sometimes this is called tenant improvement money or TI money. So you'll see in the model, we've got two line items here under leasehold improvements. We've got construction contract. And again, that's for all the stuff that kind of is the guts of the building. Doesn't include equipment, doesn't include furniture, any of that stuff. It's just the construction piece. And then landlord contribution. And what you may notice here, if you look at the model, is this nets out to less than the contract. That's because the landlord contribution is being treated as a benefit to you. So it's actually reducing your cost of your contract. So the model is doing that for you. Um, startup restaurateur, it's often really hard to get tenant improvement money from a landlord. Um, the more power you have, the more likely you are to get that money. Then one thing it's maybe a benefit, a small benefit of the situation we've been in the last 18 months is landlords are really hungry to get tenants. And in some cases, they'll give TI money to new restaurateurs when they wouldn't have done so before. I'm curious, Stephanie, I want to chime in real quick. What can we do to increase our odds of having leverage in that negotiation and that conversation? It's a good question. Um, the first thing is ask for things that are reasonable, things that are really going to add value to the building. And a lot of restaurateurs think, oh, I'm putting in a hood system, right? I'm putting in a ventilation hood and all the ductwork. That's at, that's an expensive line item that adds value. Actually, it doesn't from a landlord's perspective, because now what you've done is you've said to the landlord, the next tenant after me has to be a restaurant or they have to rip all that stuff out at great expense. The things that add value for a landlord are upgrading the electrical, upgrading the plumbing. And I don't mean adding plumbing lines for cooking equipment or, or wear washers or that kind of thing, but upgrading the bathrooms, um, uh, certainly upgrading the um, HVAC, in other words, the heating and cooling of the space, um, bringing things up to code 
if you're going into an older building and there are some things that no longer meet code, you're going to have to do those things anyway. I think going to the landlord and asking for some help with that is perfectly reasonable. But asking the right questions or at least asking for the right support is probably your best bet. Thank you. Okay. All right. So that's the first thing in this model, but that's by no means the only thing. Um, the next thing on the list is equipment. Now I've broken this out in the model into two parts, back of house equipment and front of house equipment. And back of house just means guest doesn't see it, but there's a little bit of a, a challenge there because the guests can see bar equipment. The guests might see other equipment you've got in the, in the spaces where you're preparing food, but the guest isn't actually standing there. So I usually talk about back of houses. The guest doesn't stand there. And we've got sort of three things in this line item, kitchen equipment, bar equipment, and kitchen smallwares. So let's talk about what that stuff is. Smallwares is anything that can go through a dish machine, a dishwasher. So it's all of your tableware. So if you're using reusable tableware, it's china, glass, cutlery. Um, it's certainly anything you use to prepare the food that you have to wash, pots, pans, hotel pans, ladles, all that kind of stuff. Um, other things that count as smallwares are things like garbage cans um, and uh, the soap dispenser that goes above your hand sink, that kind of stuff, even though it doesn't go through a dishwasher, typically we call that smallwares. Um, the kitchen equipment, this is where we could talk all day long and maybe future time, Eric, maybe I can come back and talk about selecting kitchen. You equipment. are always welcome back. I know this is probably where you nerd out the hardest because this is oh, kind of it's why I am single. <laughs> I will tell you a little story is uh, at one point when I was actively dating people and uh, I was on a date that really wasn't going so well and you're trying to find a nice way to end the date you don't want to be rude or whatever I would look in the glass usually you're at some place that's serving a beverage or whatever and you're looking in your glass I look in my glass and I can tell my date what kind of ice machine they have and that usually sends the date running so that <laughs> works really well for me. okay um, so kitchen equipment I'm going to take a quick digression here a lot of first time restaurateurs want to save as much money as they can on equipment. And that's not a bad idea. There are some sort of basic places where you can save money and places where you shouldn't try to save money. The places where you can save money is anything that doesn't have a motor, buy it used. So for example, there's no reason on earth to pay for new shelving, right? Shelving, you can buy used, or if it's storage shelving that you're putting in like a, a storage room, not shelving going into a walk-in refrigerator, but shelving that's going into a dry storage room or whatever, you can go to Ikea and get like the garage shelving they have. Or you, if you know somebody or if you yourself like to mess around with table saws and you know get some old pallets from the back of you know somebody's loading dock, as long as they say yes, you can take them um, and make your own shelving. There's no reason to spend lots of money on the lovely chrome wire adjustable shelving, except in your walk-in, you need proper shelving. And in that case, it's the kind that can stand up to condensation. Um, other things to buy used, you know, um, there are things like prep tables. Um, if you can find ones that are in good condition, by all means, buy them used. Simple equipment that doesn't, as I say, have a motor or any electronics in it. It's getting harder and harder to find things that don't have electronics, but you know, a good range, a simple six burner or four burner range with nothing fancy, it probably just needs a really good clean and it'll work just fine for you. There's very few moving parts in those. So think about buying anything that doesn't have a motor or electronics, buy it used. Um, the only thing that I would say to lease is your ice machine. A yeah. lot of startup restaurateurs will, will try to get a lease package of all their equipment. You probably are overspending over the life of the lease if you do that. You might think up front, oh, well, this is good. It saves me a lot of money in startup capital because I'm now treating this lease like an expense and I don't have to have all this money at the very beginning. You will spend more over time. So you're probably better off getting only one item leased, which is your ice machine, because ice machines are the first piece of equipment to die on you <laughs> um, because they're working awfully hard in a hot, moist space. Uh, but 
try to get as much stuff used as you can, but avoid anything that has a motor or electronics. So when it comes to uh, the ice machine company, is there, a, or is there a company that stands out in your mind that is a good investment? Can you, can you refer a company to us that does ice? I, 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 try to get referrals. I, want to, I don't want to get myself in trouble with all the nice people out there. I will tell you that there's three or four brands that are good, solid machines. Hoshizaki, Scotsman, Manitowoc. Okay. And you can rent, the, they, they all have options to rent. You can usually get leases on those, not directly from the manufacturer, but through your local food service equipment dealer. Okay. Um, most communities will have somebody who is a dealer of most of the major brands. And those three brands, I think, are workhorses um, and that you will, you'll be happy with the results. We're getting extra content out of you today. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> oh, my fee just went up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, all right. So we're talking about equipment. Um, I've broken out bar equipment because bar equipment you can get used with the exception of refrigeration. Um, I'm going to get a little gross for a sec, but uh, there, I don't know a single kitchen that doesn't have little six-legged friends in it. When I say six-legged friends, I'm referring to insects of some kind. You can have more legs, right? You can have eight legs. You can have no legs at all, actually, if you're really got a problem. But bar equipment, the only thing that is a concern to buy used is anything with refrigeration because the motors, critters love motors. And I say critters, I'm going to be very specific and say cockroaches. They love motors because they're warm, they're dark, they've got lubricants in them that are very tasty if you're a cockroach. So if you're buying used refrigeration for your bar or if you're getting some used refrigeration to put in your, your kitchen, make sure you give that compressor the world's best clean because you're gonna be bringing little friends into your restaurant, guaranteed, um, from refrigeration. So bar equipment, a lot of it you can buy used. And by bar equipment, I think mean the things that go behind the bar, like the, the what we call a cocktail mix unit, which is the place where the ice goes and you might have some pans or depressions for your mixers. Um, a three bay or a four bay sink, which most jurisdictions require you to have, um, those kinds of things. Okay, so that's what's in back of house equipment. Now, the usual question is how much does this stuff all cost? And I can't give you an answer because there's so many factors that go into it. But when you're really early in your business planning and you need to put a number in there, I recommend as just a placeholder number, put the number of square feet of kitchen space that you think you're going to have times 200. So kitchen size times $200. And your eyes will bug out of your head when you put that number in, but you're probably better off overestimating right now, then underestimating, and then getting hurt later on when you actually try to raise the capital and you see how much this stuff costs. You'll be shocked at how much some of this stuff costs. Um, give you an example, the ventilation hood that goes over your cooking equipment, which you do have to have for lots of different reasons. I usually budget at least $1,000 per linear foot for just the hood. So if you know you have to have a, a range, and two fryers and a you know charcoal grill or a char grill or char broiler and you know you add that all up and it ends up being nine feet of equipment you need 10 feet of hood and that's going to cost you at least ten thousand dollars before you even get to the duct work so this stuff's expensive in the the conversation i had with ken he really emphasized uh specifically when it came to hoods to not skimp yeah. uh, do you want to compound on that Absolutely. Do not skimp on the following things, your hood, your dishwasher, or your grease trap. <laughs> because if any of those things are not behaving properly, you are in a world of hurt. So hood, and when I say hood, ventilation hood and associated equipment, your dishwasher and your grease trap. All right. I'm already going way past the time I want you to. Oh. You, you got me in the equipment. It's my fault. It's my fault. <laughs> I can talk all day. Uh, so let's see what the next few sections of this model look like. Um, so front of house equipment, that is the furniture, right? You've got seating, you know, tables, chairs, booths, banquettes, whatever it is you're doing in the front. One term you'll come across when you're talking to contractors or talking to landlords maybe is this term millwork. 
It refers to any custom woodworking. So when you put in a bar, for example, the thing that the guest leans on and is sort of backing up your equipment, that's called the bar die. Uh, that's usually custom built, that's called millwork. Um, and you know whether you're gonna have art, uh, menu boards, all that kind of stuff falls under front of house equipment. Um, you can buy a lot of stuff used for used furniture. There's lots of it around. Uh, used furniture is just fine. Um, where a lot of people come to grief when they're doing their capital budget is this includes the fees you have to pay to the people who are helping you. Even though it's not something concrete you can put your hands on, it's still capital budget expense or part of the capital budget. So that's the fees to your architect or your engineer or both. You need these people to get a building permit. So you might think, oh, you know, it's fine. I'm just going to have my contractor get the permit. If you're, depending on what you're doing to your building, you probably need them to be professionally signed off by an architect or an engineer. So you'll need to pay these people for their services. Um, most of them will not roll out of bed for less than $10,000. Hmm. Um, so if you have family members who are in these fields, please don't ask them to do it for free. <laughs> but you could maybe get a deal out of them if you give them lots of yummy food. Same thing with legal assistance. Um, you need people to read over the lease, read over the terms of, of your incorporation, all the stuff that you have to do to set up your business. There's legal expenses. Please don't ask professionals to do it for free, even if they love you dearly. Let them offer, but don't ask them to do it for free. Um, but maybe they'll give you a discount. Um, same thing with your accounting and tax specialists. Um, this is where a lot of entrepreneurs go, oh my gosh, I need an accounting or a tax specialist. It doesn't hurt to help set you up in a way that you don't have to wrestle with this stuff later on. Yeah. This is an interesting conversation because I, I, I always kind of had the mindset of starting with like, uh, the, I've always gathered the, the two things that you must get off this list that you, that you've shared with us legal and accounting are the, probably the most important, um, over, I mean, when starting, I see what you're saying, why you need the architect and the kitchen consultant and all that stuff. But like over time, legal and accounting. Uh, but I've also through conversation, I've heard that like tools like Restaurant 365 might not be out of reach for the small independent operator, uh, especially early on, because if you don't start with if you don't start off the right way, it's much more difficult later on while you're running your businesses to incorporate the more robust systems. Do you have an opinion on that? I'm curious. Um, I agree 100%. You're better off to set up the systems at the beginning. What I will tell you is most people who create restaurants, there are so many things you have to know. Bring on expertise to help you. Do not feel like you have to do this all yourself. You know, you're bootstrapping and you're a scrappy entrepreneur. That's great. But get the advice early. It's worth every penny because you're going to find you're going to be pulled in so many different directions. A lot of people during their build out of their restaurant think they're going to be their own project manager. You know, I'm going to manage the build out and I'm going to you think of all the things you have to do when you're starting a restaurant, right? You're developing your market and you're testing recipes and you're hiring and training staff and you're, you know, negotiating with the bank for financing. And the last thing you need to be doing is being on calls with, you know, determining a, a battle between the electrician and the HVAC person about where they're going to run a line, that, that should not be something that you have to deal with. So I know that sort of takes a bit away from what you were saying, Eric, but the bigger thing is get the help early, get set up correctly early, and the rest will be easier because it's hard enough. Doing yeah, you're reminding me of the saying, if you don't have enough money to do it right the first time, what makes you think you're going to be able to do it right? or fix your mistakes or do it. I'm, I'm butchering the saying, but it's the idea. If you, if you don't do it right the first time, you're not going to be able to do it a second time. So really like figure out like budget and figure out exactly what it's going to cost and have that be your mark and do it right the first time and let yeah. cash flow and people determine your growth, right? There you go. There you go. But, but also be smart about where you can economize. So as we go through this, I'll point out additional places you can economize, right? I've talked a bit about you stuff. Um, and you may not necessarily need all this consulting assistance. You don't need to pay a kitchen consultant, says she, the kitchen consultant, um, when you first start out, because your kitchen equipment dealer, the people who sell you equipment, will usually provide this service for you for free. Um, you, you don't need to hire someone to do this unless you're doing something on a very big scale. Um, so there, I just shot myself in the foot. Uh, Moving into the next category, there's a lot of little details here. I'm not going to go into them in a lot of, of 
detail myself, but a lot of these, you're going to have to make some calls to find out what the prices are in your market. So some of these are insurance costs or uh, costs for your uh, workers' compensation. If you're hiring staff, you're going to need to have some uh, workers' compensation value or a binder in place. Um, what the liquor license situation is, if you have liquor, and uh, same thing with building permits. It usually is a function of how much the value of the construction is. So you can't get a price for your building permit until you know what you're spending on construction. So there's a bit of a circular reference there. Um, but you'll find every community has different licensing for you know, food production. And you know, many of you I know are testing recipes and sharing food with people as you develop your concept. And that's wonderful. Do be aware that if you are selling the food that you're preparing. So if someone is hiring you to make something for a party, whatever, you should be using an inspected kitchen or you could open yourself up to liability problems. Um, and that could be really challenging for getting insurance in the future. So just be aware that if you are doing anything for money, you need to be using a kitchen that's been inspected. So whether that's a kitchen in a you know, church basement or in a school or a restaurant that you're borrowing their kitchen to do stuff, uh, in off hours, just make sure you're on the right side of the regulations there. Um, all right, moving on to the next category, because it's another one we could talk all day about, but I won't spend a lot of time here because to be honest, it's not my area of expertise, which is the technology for running the business in terms of point of sale systems, table management systems, ordering systems. You can spend a lot of money here and this is something that I would say, talk to people who have done it and get their advice because the software changes constantly. Eric, you want to add something? Um, I, how did you know? I mean, I'm just sitting here. Was a, there a smirk on my face or something? Yeah, or? No, there's the, the open mouth. I, I, oh. I want to say something. <laughs> I'm curious. Um, and I'm trying to get some, some, some referrals out of you right now. If you were to, if you want, if you needed to go to somebody, who's a tech nerd and who's, who's in your network who you'd go to tomorrow if, if, if you need to get help on the subject? I have- um, I'm Always a, trying to get a little extra. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, I'm trying to be cautious to not like specify particular companies because yeah. that's not what I'm, the business I'm in. I have a lot of former students out there. And so I would reach out to former students who are running restaurants or restaurant groups and say, who are you using? Mm -hmm. um, so use the network of people you know in the restaurant industry. Now, I know that doesn't answer your question. No, um, it makes me but, feel like I'm doing something really right right now, though. No, you do. <laughs> I mean, there is, there's absolutely no downside to cultivating a, a network of people that you admire, right? That's what, Eric, you're doing with this yeah. whole Restaurant of South Little Network. But use the people you know. Same thing when you're going to do a build out. You think, oh, where do I find a contractor? Go to restaurants that you admire in your market and just ask them who they used. You say, you know, I, I'm just, I'm curious, who did you use for your build out and were you happy? Mm -hmm. And before too long, if you ask about 10 restaurateurs in your market, who they used for their build out and were they happy, three or four names will bubble to the top. And okay, now you know that those are the companies that you want to reach out to for your build out. Same thing with technology. I would talk to, you know, I have a student named Ryan Pernice who has three restaurants in Roswell, Georgia. And I would contact Ryan and say, Ryan, buddy, who do you use? What do you like? And I would do the same thing with another student, Adam Lathan, who's got two restaurants, one in Nashville and one in Brooklyn. And I'd call him up and Adam, who are you using? Who do you like? And you do that with maybe 10 different people you know, the names will bubble up. Awesome. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, so the, the list that you see in the capital budget here, security system, music, sound, AV systems, point of sale, you may not need all of these depending on your concept. You will need a point of sale system though. And back to Eric's point earlier, get the best point of sale system you possibly can. Because not only is it really going to make your life easy when it comes time for reporting for tax purposes or whatever, but the data that these provide to you as a, an owner and operator is invaluable. A good point of sale is, is like a good right hand. Um, and the point of sale systems now, many of them have really excellent data tools in them. 
Um, if you're a real data nerd like me, you can extract the data and you can slice it and dice it all kinds of cool ways. But a really good point of sale system is worth the investment. Absolutely. Don't skip there. Yeah. But, Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, but you may not, a lot of these other things, you may not need to spend money on table management. Don't even worry about it until you get to be a pretty big size. Yeah. And I think a lot of times people are really surprised if you're looking, we have the video in front of us. If, if you're watching this right now, you'll see it too. If you're listening, there's a list of all the, on the right side of what we're looking at, there's a, next to all these items, there's a, an approximation of what to spend that uh, Stephanie had filled out. And I think people get a, really surprised by the cost of music and sound and audio visual, like 12,500. I, I'm pretty sure I know why that's so expensive, but what's the reason why you need to spend $12,500 for music? Well, and you may not need to, depends on your concept, right? But I, these values, by the way, are, are just a first approximation and they are very different depending on where you are in the country. Um, you know, if your concept is one that has, for example, you're having live music, um, you're gonna need a different audio system. Um, if you are a concept that does catered events and you're gonna have people coming in with DJs or you're gonna need a public address system built into your building, yeah, you might spend this amount. So, or you might just say, I need a couple of really great speakers and, and I'm gonna call it a day. It really depends on your concept. So again, these numbers don't mean that, oh my gosh, I should have this number in my budget. It just gives you sort of a place to begin. But I put these numbers in to just give you an order of magnitude to tell you that don't be surprised. Yeah. That point of sale with two or three terminals is going to cost you 20 grand. Don't be surprised because it, it could. Kitchen equipment, that's why I put $200,000 on that line item. It stuff's expensive. Yeah. And um, I mean, when I'm re reflecting back on the music too, is like the lines, the licensing, like if, if you have a business and you're using media or entertainment, like it makes it more expensive. You can't just hit the rate or you can't just play music personally. It's not the same. Like if you're using music for a business, you, you got to pay the artist. And there's usually services you have to go through who set that up. Like soundtrack, your brand is one that I know of, uh, which is uh, they go through Spotify, but you can't just play Spotify in your restaurant. I see everybody does this. I think, I don't know how they manage and track all that. If you're one of these companies, but you can get in a lot of trouble. So, and, and yeah. it's the service. Yeah. So, I mean, pay the 1200, 500, the 12, the 12, five upfront. Don't get in trouble with like stealing music. That's essentially what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm, I'm looking again at the clock and, you know, my eyes are bugging out of my head. So I'm going to, uh, to move <laughs> along a little bit here. I'm uh, okay with you going over just for the record. Okay. I'm, I mean, as, but I want to respect your time. Well, and also I know people are, are listening and there's only so long you can listen before you're like, I can't take it. We can listen to you for right. a minute, Stephanie. So take a pause, go get a cup of tea. <laughs> Actually, this is uh, a great spot to take our first break to thank our sponsors. We'll be right back. We're back. Go for it, Stephanie. Okay. So we've been talking about stuff that you need to put into your capital budget. Um, if you have a building and you've got a parking lot, you may need to spend some money on that. You know, when landscaping might be just potted plants that you have outside, but you're probably going to need exterior signage. This is another thing that costs more than people think. They're like, oh, I'm going to get one of those backlit signs I can find on the line. You know, it's $450. A backlit sign can send a message that you maybe don't want. So I'm going to circle just for a moment to talk about your concept. The more you know about who your customer is and what they care about, the better decisions you can make during capital budgeting because you wanna make sure that everything you're building is in alignment with the things that you think your market cares about. So signage is a great example because if you go cheap on your signage, it makes your operation look cheap. Even though it may not be, you might have amazing food and a great service, a great experience and great value, all those good things. If you diminish the what it looks like to the guest and signage is a big part of that, you will undersell yourself. And that's not gonna be a, a winning strategy. So don't skimp on your exterior signage. If you need to skimp on signage, the signage that goes on the, the restroom door, you can just paint, you know, restroom, wash your hands and be done with it, right? You don't have to worry about spending a lot of money there. All right. So we've talked about the things that are concrete with the exception of fees and, and permits. Most of the things we've been talking about so far in the capital budget are things you can touch, right? But there's a lot of stuff that you spend money on before you actually open that need to be part of the capital budget. 
And that's what I have in the model down here. So pre-opening expenses. And there's a few things that have been built in here for you. Um, one of them is the amount of money that you'll be spending on the utilities in the building before you open. A lot of people think that they open the doors to their restaurant and now they are spending money on water and sewer and electrical and heating. And no, you need all those things while you're in construction. You certainly have water and electricity during construction. So you need to pay for your utilities during that time. This particular model does overestimate how much you're spending. It just takes what you think you're spending per month for your operations and just multiplies that by the number of months you think you're going to be in construction. I think it's okay to overestimate in the capital budget because again, it's better to overestimate and not spend that much than to not have the amount of money in the budget and then get yourself in trouble later on. So this part of the model is taking both the utilities and what you're spending on your lease during construction. Now, you might have negotiated with your landlord to get a grace period. In other words, a rent-free period that you can use while you're in construction, either to cover the whole time that you're building out or part of that time. Um, I'm making the assumption, again, in this model that there's no grace period, again, to err on the side of being conservative. But if you do get some kind of grace period, you could go in and adapt this model to accommodate that. Um, things that you have to pay for up front as well. If you have a loan, you're paying interest on that loan when the minute you get the money, not when your restaurant opens, but when you get the money. So I've got a line item here for interest. Um, be nice to your contractors. So when they're building out, like make them food, right? Bring them, because trust me, contractors are very, very hard to get and good ones are even harder to get. So is that, is that your experience? So no, it's your test market. Feed them, get feedback before you open. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And they will go, if you give them some of your food and they're like, this is really good, they'll go and tell people. They'll say, oh man, I'm building out this restaurant. And yeah, this guy named Eric, he seems really nice. He made this pizza, man, for lunch. Calzone, calzone. Calzone, calzone. <laughs> yeah, pizza that's been filled up. Um, you'll, you'll find that you'll get good word of mouth from doing this. So carry some money to cover the food costs and the effort that you're gonna to spend to treat your contractors right. I love it. Um, opening inventories of uniforms, food, beer, paper, and so on. Um, marketing, I've just got some sort of uh, fill-in numbers here. You can spend much more than this, but please plan on spending something. When I work with students, they often say, oh, marketing, I'm just gonna do social media. That has no cost. Oh, yes, it does. <laughs> um, good social media, right? Eric's smiling at me. Yeah. Well, just your own time, too. I think people underestimate the amount of time and effort goes into documenting everything. And I mean, the, 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 the time cost is there. Something you have to consider. Outsource it. Focus on opening your restaurant. So you're, you need some line items. Some of these, you may not have an opening party. You may not do any, you know, pre-opening comps. By that mean, just, you know, promotions where you're giving stuff away. Um, but many of you have been talking about your preparing food and giving it to people to get their feedback and so on. Technically, that's part of your pre-opening promotion and comps. So the food cost that you have there, maybe I put that in the line item. Um, if you want to go down the road of hiring a public relations person, they're probably going to cost you more than 10 grand. They're expensive for a good one. Um, a lot of people will hang out a shingle and say they're a PR person, but again, better to talk to restaurateurs that you admire and say, are you using a PR company? Are you happy with them? Um, but for a lot of startup restaurateurs, you may not necessarily want to go down this road. It really depends on the concept you have, the market you're going into, um, what kind of facility you're building out. Um, I've just got the line item here for the kinds of concepts that require this. So you said it really depends on the kind of concept you have. What are some of the variables that make, might make you lean towards getting a PR without getting into too much detail? Um, size is a big one. The bigger your restaurant, the more PR you're going to need to fill those seats. And again, I'm going to say something I think I said in the very first podcast we did together, which is small is better than big. It is much better to undersize your restaurant and have very few seats and grow into that and grow into a bigger space than to start with a really big space. Ooh, I hear this a lot. People say, whether you're opening a 200 seat restaurant or a 20 seat restaurant, the amount of work you have to do to 
the day to day is, is, is not too far off because you still have to go through the same motions. You're just doing it for 200 people or 20 people. Uh, and I, man, I don't know if I agree with, I mean, yes, I mean, it's a volume game. You're going to have more volume, but that's also more expense. And if you can't fill those seats, if you, if you're, if, if you're too confident and you think you're going to be able to fill the seats and then you can't, you're just going to be losing money, like scale into it over time. Yeah, absolutely. Don't open a 200 seat restaurant. If it's your first restaurant, please promise me you will all avoid opening a 200 seat restaurant as your first I restaurant. Promise. Um, the sweet spot seems to be like between 50 and 80 seats. Um, and, you know, we can argue all day about whether that makes sense for every concept under the sun, but there seems to be a sweet spot um, that you can run it with a smaller number of people. And you also don't need as big a space. Um, because really in the restaurant industry, we don't sell food so much as we rent space to people for a short period of time. And Seats. they they they're paying for their rent in terms of what they buy in terms of food yeah so uh if you have a big space you need a lot of people to rent space from you okay all right so now we're talking about small restaurants small restaurants mean fewer people to run them which in today's market is a good thing it's very hard to find people and to, to keep people um but you do need to pay those people before your restaurant opens because you're training them or you're bringing them up to speed maybe you're hiring an assistant manager who's going to work with you um you're going to bring on hourly staff they need to be trained and you've got to pay payroll tax on the things you're paying them before you open all of that is part of your capital budget um these days a lot of people use recruitment tools you know whether it's online services like zip recruiter or whatever there's a fee for that so you need a line item to cover those recruitment costs all right so in this sample, for those of you listening as opposed to seeing, you'll notice a rather horrific looking number. It's over a million dollars I have in this sample. And that is by no means an unusual number. Um, it's again, it's hard to say what your restaurant's going to cost um, because there's so many variables. But when people are starting out, I say, imagine you're spending between three and $500 per square foot for your development cost. And development cost is everything we've talked about so far, whether you can touch it or whether it's fees or permits or expenses that you have to spend before you open. So that three to $500 a foot is a pretty wide range. But again, the more you know about your concept, the more you can tighten that up. But it's a pretty good starting point. And a lot of you right now are probably like choking on your coffee at that number. Um, and I know there are lots of people who've done it for less, of course. But again, rather you err on the side of caution. But we're not done. Um, <laughs> there's two more things in the capital budget that a lot of people don't realize need to be there. And in the model, I've got these a little bit below. So we've got total development cost of all the things we've talked about so far. And then there's total project cost. The difference you're including is working capital and contingency. So let's talk a little bit about what those are and how the model is treating those. Let's start with contingency. Um, contingency is just a pot of money you put aside for we'll call unpleasant surprises because they're always unpleasant surprises, right? You open up a wall thinking you're just going to you know, run some wiring in it and you discover that there's been mold back there and that needs, you need to replace some studs. That, that's a small expense, but you know, that happens all the time more likely there will be bigger expenses that you didn't expect you know pieces of equipment that arrive damaged and you know think okay well i've got to ship those back and get a new one and i'm going to get compensated for that money but i need the money up front to pay for that and then i'll get compensated later um or you you know something breaks i had a student who was building out their restaurant and they had all this <laughs> I would not recommend this. They had all this imported tile from Italy. It was beautiful tile. It all arrived broken. Oh. Yeah, all of it. It was like there were two tiles that were broken. And instead of going, well, I, I'm going to order another shipment of tile. And, and you know, this was going to hold up their opening. So he went to Home Depot and he's like, okay, uh, I'll take uh, 200 of those tiles and 250 of those tiles and kind of like, ah. it, you know, it was fine for your restaurant. First restaurant, please don't order tile from Italy. Yeah. <laughs> it's a Home Depot tile is fine uh, for your first restaurant. Um, so contingency is a bucket of money for those kinds of issues. And believe me, they will happen. 
what the model has in it is I have created a little sort of drop down box here and the little model is giving me some text I'll just scroll past it. If you're going into an older building and when I say older I mean more than say 20 years old carry more contingency money than you think you might need because older buildings tend to have more problems and they tend to be poorly documented. What I mean by that is there aren't good drawings that show you exactly where the plumbing is or good drawings that show you exactly where the electrical is. And there might be things that no longer meet code. So the older the building that you're leasing in, the bigger the contingency budget you need to have. The question is how much bigger? And so what this model has is really a drop down. You can choose whether you want a very lean contingency budget you know, I'm going, I'm doing a very simple budget or a simple project. I'm going into a new building or a very, you know, simple building. I'm not really that worried. I'm going to carry a lean amount and it will calculate for you what that should be based on the other information you've already provided in the model. For most of you, I would say adequate is probably a good choice. So I've got lean, adequate and conservative. And if, again, if you're going into an old building, put in conservative. Um, so contingency then is your bucket of what I call surprise money. Um, I have friends who use a different word that start with S instead of surprise, um, but uh, I'll use the term surprise. I've heard in, in my interviews, this is a, a topic that comes up a lot, is people don't, they don't work enough of a contingency in, and the, the budget almost always goes over. And I've heard frequently that at least 50% on top of what you, like whatever you think it is going to take, take 50% and add that. Do you think that's over conservative? Well, it's over 50% is crazy high, but I can see why people would say that if they were too lean in their estimates of everything else. So earlier on, I said, you know, be, uh, be sort of pessimistic with kitchen equipment, allow $200 a foot in your kitchen. For your hood, allow $1,000 a linear foot. If you are being conservative in your line items, day your one. kitchen doesn't have to be so big. Yeah. Uh, another thing that I'm staring at this uh, spreadsheet right now and personnel that I don't, and if it came up, I apologize. How much working capital do you think, how much time do you think you need to project out into the future for your personnel, like chefs, like hourly employees? Because you want cash flow in, in reserve to pay them for at least the, what, the first six months, would you say the first year? Like what, how much extra do you need to pay your people before the cash starts rolling in? Well, the, that's an excellent question, not a bad question at all. What you see in this model is what you're paying those people before you actually open. And then what you're talking about is the very next thing on this model, which is working capital. And you need that working capital. This is a bucket of money to do just what Eric said, which is to pay staff and fixed costs and food costs and all those things while you are early in your operation and hopefully ramping up to being profitable because very few restaurants are profitable right out of the gate. What you typically see is what I'll call the roller coaster, which is you're spending lots of money, you get to the very top of the roller coaster and you open and at first you're making money because people are coming in to try you. And then you've got a big swoop down where you're not making any money at all because early adopters have all come to you once and it may be a while before they come back again. And you're also trying to build your market. So it's not unusual for your first week or two that you're really crushing it and money's coming in. You think, this is awesome. I'm going to, this is the best thing ever. Don't be surprised if the next six months are really not that great. Yeah. This is, this is why I think a tool like Ovation from day one is so important because you often only get one chance to impress somebody and capture their information. So with a tool like Ovation, you start ca capturing that contact information from day one, which lets you stay top of mind so you can remarket yourself to them going into the future and to bring them back in. So back to your question, Eric, about how long should you... That's where this little drop down in the working capital, it's similar to what we have in contingency. You've got three choices, lean, adequate, and conservative. What I've built into the model is lean, I think is two months. Adequate is six months. Conservative, I think is nine months. Got it. Thank you. And it's not just your staff. It's all those other things, right? It's your other fixed costs, your, your lease, your utilities, you, you know, all the other things that you're spending money on. And in the, the original version of this model, which some of you may have downloaded before this update was made available, 
um, it was just a blank here. There was no formula. There's nothing. And I think for a lot of people, it's a little hard to figure out what you should put in here. Um, what I normally will tell people is you should have six months of fixed cost and at least three months of variable cost as a minimum. So what does that mean? Six months of fixed cost is the expenses you just can't get away from. Your lease, um, loan payments. Um, there are some things that are somewhat fixed, like you know management salaries, or and other things are somewhat variable. Like your utilities is somewhat variable. There's kind of a low a, a, a baseline that you have to pay, and then there's a variable component on top of that. Payroll is the same. It's people think about payroll as being a variable cost. It's not really. It's what we call a step function, which is for each change of volume, you've got sort of a fixed element. I've got to have this many staff. And then I can have a little bit of variable until I get to the next level. And then I've got another level of fixed. So this is, this is getting too geeky for you. It's okay. You can fast forward through this. But um, <laughs> this this, a, lot, a lot of that is built right in here. But there's a very scary looking formula here. If those of you who are um, uh, Excel geeks and you want to mess around the model, you can, you know, there's the formula. It's an if statement and you can have a great old time seeing how I've calculated this. Can you do me a favor and copy that formula and put it into the, the, uh, the chat? Sure. Uh, I just tried to do it and realize that you're sharing your screen and I can't copy it. <laughs> can you, I, I will do that when I'm finished. Is that okay? That's perfect. That's perfect. Yeah. Um, and, and your mileage may vary. And that is sort of something I have to put as a caveat for everything I say is I'm basing what I tell you on 27 years of advising people on starting restaurants and the information that I get back from people who've done it. But there is an enormous distribution of, of how people have done it and how much they've spent. And, and a lot of people say, I'm just gonna take the average. Averages are dangerous uh, because you always get outliers that kind of pull that average around. So recognize that your mileage may vary, but by going through this model and looking at these line items, it makes you at least think about them. And you may say, I don't need this for my concept. I don't need it at all. Or this number seems really high. Do the due diligence to make sure that it is high for what kind of concept and market that you're going into. Don't just sort of pull it out of your hat and say, oh, no, I don't need that zero or oh, I don't need $200 for, for a computer, it's fine. Um, I'm gonna end my sort of presentation part and then we can open the floor for questions uh, seeing as we're almost at 11. But one thing to be aware of is the sorts of things that you buy for your home are not the kinds of things you will buy for a restaurant. So whether that is furniture or equipment, um, there are a lot of resources out there where you can go on and say, oh, look, there's a $50 chair. I'm just going to buy a hundred of those. I, who wants it? They will last you three months and then you'd be buying me more chairs. Yeah. And if you get somebody who uh, maybe shouldn't sit in a cheap seat, I don't know if you're picking up what I'm putting down, you're going to have some really large people that roll through your restaurant. It's, it's inevitable. You can't have them sitting in something cheap. It's yeah. not going to end well. <laughs> so they, I'll leave you with this idea. Spend the money on the things that the guest comes into contact with. Yeah. And that includes your people. Spend the money on those. If you need to economize, do it on the things the guest does not come into contact with. Like the tile you put on the wall. You know, if the tile looks clean, it's fine. It doesn't have to be imported from Italy. But have a nice piece of cutlery. Don't have a fork that the guests can just bend, you know, maybe even with their mind, you know, just you want to make sure that anything the guest comes into contact with represents you as best it possibly can. Awesome. Great stuff. Stephanie, I've loved this conversation. Anything else you haven't gotten out? Oh, gosh. Um, well, I think I've got sort of gone through the whole model here and where it ends at the bottom is it gives you a development cost per square foot. This is not including working capital and contingency because no bank is going to lend you money for working capital or contingency. <laughs> um, so that money is, is going to have to come from other sources. I mean, this is where it's your funds or friends and family. Um, but it gives you the development cost and per square foot and per seat. If you, the seat, I wouldn't worry about too much. Um, there are some benchmarks out there. Uh, I was trying to find a good source of benchmarks for you before we got going this morning or this afternoon, if you're listening in the evening. Um, I couldn't find a resource that I would rely on to give you sort of a, a benchmark. Um, 
If you are a reader of the magazine Restaurant Startup and Growth, um, which is a great resource, um, a freely, uh, full disclosure, I write for that magazine, but I write for it because I think it's a good resource. Um, but they have profiles of newly opened restaurants in every issue. And they often have the amount that was spent. And they often also include how many square feet of kitchen and how much square footage of front of house and how many seats. So you can start, I, I actually did track some of that information for a while. It's been years since I've gone and, and done all that, but I was sort of tracking what people were actually spending. Um, and so you can do that yourself, looking at the more recent issues and just get a feel for what people are spending per seat and or per square foot, just to give yourself a ballpark. Beautiful. And just a reminder that everything that we're covering today, uh, this spreadsheet, which I believe, is it titled Financial Model Sample? Is that what you're looking for? It is called heard? Financial Model Sample. Um, okay. If you go to the restaurantowner.com website and you just search for business plan templates, you will find the downloads for this um, and you will find the file mark template and you'll find the file mark sample. And we're on the, the capital budget tab of that spreadsheet right now. If you guys are trying to get to what we are looking at right now, if you're watching the video and if you are a listener of Restaurant Unstoppable and you don't watch our YouTube channel, shame on you because Jared <laughs> killing it over there. He's, he's, he's constantly adding. Um, I, every time I travel on site to a restaurant, we're videotaping the, the interviews. And uh, this is a very visual heavy episode. So I highly encourage you to head over to Restaurant Unstoppable's YouTube channel. Uh, and subscribe and we'll have the video component of today's episode over there waiting for you. And if you're in Restaurant Unstoppable Network, you will have it there as well. Uh, anything we have not mentioned before we take one more quick break to thank our sponsors and open it back up for q and I think the only other thing I'm going to mention is if you are working with this spreadsheet um, and if you're looking at what's on the screen now, you'll see a whole section of the spreadsheet we haven't talked about where it says cost classification used to calculate depreciation and amortization. Don't even worry about it. It's all <laughs> just stuff behind the scenes. I, I tried to actually collapse that so I don't have to look at it. It's just part of the, the nuts and bolts of the model. Don't worry about what it says or how it's working. It's going to do what it needs to do. So don't, don't monkey with it, but don't worry about it. Yeah. Um, awesome. And just one more quick reminder, if you guys are not members of restaurantowner.com, when you join Restaurant Unstoppable Network, you get six months free access. And I encourage you to take that path to getting over there because it supports the show. Thank you in advance. One more quick break to thank our sponsors, and we'll be right back to answer some questions. Do you need a sip of water or anything? You good? I'm good. All right. We are back and we're going to open it up for some Q and A that probably should have uh, prompted the individuals who are joining us today. If you want to ask a question or join the conversation or just chit chat, go ahead and just throw your hand up uh, and we'll unmute your mic and you can ask your question. It doesn't have to be a question. It could just be dialogue. Don't be shy. If you don't say, so. oh, here we go. Michael, lowering your hand, go ahead and unmute your mic and join the conversation. Thank you. Well, first, I want to thank uh, Stephanie for her professionalism. Uh, smart, articulate, thorough, um, and, and catchatory to you for having someone like this on well, your She network. compensates me because I'm none of those things. Uh, <laughs> none of that is but, true. But, but I, I totally appreciate you having someone like this on your network uh, to help a person like me and everyone else uh, in the Unstoppable. So thank you both for, for that. Uh, my question, Stephanie, uh, for budgeting uh, for equipment uh, and is uh, buying versus leasing versus financing versus auction. Ah, aha. Okay. So for your concept, because you're doing bakery, correct? Bakery gourmet sandwich. Yes. Okay. So there are some items that uh, you could certainly buy at auction. Anything you buy at auction, recognize that it's going to need a heck of a clean and some attend and, and you know it's buyer beware. Um, so you want to do some homework to find out what brands are good brands of the equipment that you think you're going to need. And again, the homework is 
talk to people who have those operations and what they use. Or in the cases of kitchen equipment, you can actually just go look, right? You can go into other bakery cafes and like, what kind of baking equipment are you using? Because pe restaurant people want to share and they'll be happy to say, oh, I use a, I have a, you know, Blodgett deck oven that is like a workhorse. I love that thing. I've got a baker's pride countertop oven that I use for the, the non-convection, I, you know, whatever it is. Um, so again, simple items, auction is fine. I, auction used, but recognize it's going to need a lot of attention. Um, I, as you heard me mention earlier, uh, I'm not a fan of leasing unless it's something that has a tendency to break and need a lot of attention. So ice machine uh, or maybe, maybe your dish machine, but not for a bakery. Um, the financing, you know, Again, it's really hard to get financing for kitchen equipment because banks don't want to claim it <laughs> if you don't pay your bills. Um, so generally, my recommendation is for, for you is make a, a list of all the things you think you need. And part of that is by going around to other operations and just make, and then get as much of that used as you can, whether it is from restaurants that are changing hands, um, at auction, it, you know, go to a couple of auctions first and just sit on your hands, don't buy anything and just watch how it works. Um, and know the brands that you're looking for. It's like buying a car. It really is because at auction, you know, you can get amazing deals or you can get scary things like cars that have been underwater. So know what brands you're looking for, know what features you're looking for, um, do your homework and an auction's fine. Okay. Thank you. Great question. Wes, I see your hand up. Go for it. Don't forget to unmute your mic. Just talking to the void on my own. Um, <laughs> so one question that I've got is uh, financing. So assuming uh, you've got something that makes it somewhat attractive for a bank or SBA or something else to, to actually consider a, a restaurant loan, uh, which I know is difficult, what aspects of the capital budget would you recommend uh, sort of trying to gravitate towards specifically? I know we talked about uh, working capital and contingency not being something, but if you can pick off the list, uh, what's the things to go for? You mean in terms of getting a loan to support? Yes. Um, well, your construction budget. Absolutely. Um, because your construction budget, think about it. If you're getting a loan, um, if a bank has to foreclose on the loan, um, the, let's hope that never happens. But if, if it's an asset that you own, and I know in your case, Wes, it may be an asset that you own. If that asset has more value, the bank's more likely to be comfortable lending for it. So your construction budget, banks are used to making construction loans all the time. What a lot of banks will do though, if you are in a position to get a loan, again, that's hard to do for a restaurant, but for, you can get a construction loan and then usually you will refinance after you're open um, because the terms of the loan will change. Think of it this way from the bank's perspective is when they lend to you to build out a restaurant that doesn't exist yet, that's a very high risk for them. So your terms are gonna be higher, right? Because the, 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 the rate is gonna be a function of the risk. So your rate's gonna be higher. Once you're open and have cash flow, you might be in a position to go back to the bank and say, uh, let's renegotiate this loan. It's the, the risk has gone down. So I say all that only because the things the bank's going to be willing to loan against are the things that will make the asset more valuable. So construction loan, um, maybe equipment, depending on what it is you're putting in, um, uh, expenses for like the outside landscaping, um, parking lot maintenance, that kind of stuff. They, they're much more likely. The things that are ephemeral, so permits, um, you know, paying employees and so on, I say ephemeral because you can't put your hands on it. Uh, those things are harder to get loans for. Yeah, and this is something that, and I think I mentioned, I alluded to it earlier, the idea of paying somebody, having like to account for somebody to set you up with your technology, because it's such a big, it's a big upfront cost to have somebody come in and to set up your, your technology suite, but that's going to help you operate so much more 
effectively and efficiently over time. And you can lean more on your technology than you can on people and people are a huge expense. I feel like that is something to absolutely highly consider working into your budget is getting somebody to come in and not just tell you what to get, but to literally help you launch your technology to make sure everything is lined up because you will save yourself so many nightmares. <laughs> if you if you can find somebody who specializes in, I'm, I'm talking specifically your POS and whatever back of house accounting inventory system you have, if you can get that fine tuned as, as much as possible from day one, I think you're going to save yourself so much time and headache and probably money that you're going to lose just from making stupid little mistakes, right? Yeah. Good advice. Did you say that? And I just re repeated or no, 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 you're spot on. You're spot on. Uh, we have another hand up. It's Wes again. Go for it, bro. Uh, so I guess I, I want to just sort of throw it at you as to uh, where are the biggest mistakes that people make when uh, they start to build out this capital budget? Okay, good. Excellent question. And I will tell you the number one is what I'll call cockiness. I don't need that. It's fine. Oh, I can just, you know, I can just do that myself or my uncle will do it for free. Under, under budgeting and feeling like you can do it yourself. Um, there are some things you can do yourself. There's no reason to hire a professional painter if you are doing a small restaurant and you get a bunch of friends together and you get some beer and you paint the restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> um, paint is your best friend, by the way. Uh, a lot of people think they, they spend too much money on the wrong things. So cockiness, spending money on the wrong things, spending money on stuff that doesn't come into contact with the guest, spending money on things that you're going to have to change later, spending money on things that you're going to have to replace later. So I mentioned, you know, buying cheap because you think I don't have much money, I'm going to buy a cheap chair, or I'm going to go down to Target and buy a blender. Why should I go to an equipment dealer and buy a commercial blender? I can get a, an Oster blender at Target for $39. And yeah, you'll be buying them every six weeks. And, you know, okay, if you have something you want to do, go ahead. Um, other mistakes, not having a contingency budget, not having a working capital budget. Um, another mistake is not doing things lawfully. Uh, you want to follow the rules. I know sometimes the rules can be annoying, like, oh, I have to get this permit or, oh, I have to, you know, but believe me, the, the things that will happen if you don't do things lawfully, sure, maybe you'll get away with it, but maybe you won't. And the won't is really painful. <laughs> so do it right. Get, you know, do building permits, right? You know, get your food permit. Do I'm totally supporting what Stephanie is saying right now, I will also say I'm not a lawyer, uh, <laughs> disclosure or dis disclaimer, but also starting really, really small, really, really, really small helps you kind of stay off the radar. Not suggesting we should be unlawful. I'm just saying the bigger you go, the harder it is to, the more eyes are going to be on you. Yeah. And many of those eyes, um, let me give you an example, health inspectors, health inspectors, um, there is no, there, it's not an opinion-based business. In other words, if they say something, that's what you have to do, even if it's not in the code. I'll give you an example. Um, former student working on a, a, an operation, you know, was following what looked like the rules, would say, you know, you need to hand sync in such and such a location relative to other things. And so they did that the health inspector came through and said, that hand sink is two feet out from where it needs to be. You need to move it before I'll give you your permit. And he wanted to argue with the health inspector. I'm like, don't, 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 just move it. Just spend the $2,000, $2,000 to move that hand sink because now you're plumbing, you have to bring the plumber back and da, 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 da. Um, worth it. Because trust me, it's, it's not an opinion base where you can argue with them about what the code says. You have to be willing to just go with what they tell you. Now, unless it's you know ridiculous and they say, oh, you know, you can't have a restaurant in this location, even though the drawings have been signed off on. But recognize that that this is not a fight. Um, this is a collaboration. And the more you think collaboratively with landlords and contractors and inspectors, the better everything will go. Yeah. I love that last piece of advice. These people are on your side. They're part of your team. They're an extension of you. Don't be a dick. 
<laughs> well, that's one way of putting it. Yes. Uh, awesome. So one more hand I see up. Um, that isn't to say we can't field another question, but Sean, we're coming to you. Awesome. Hey, uh, so I guess I'm building out a restaurant kind of right in this capital stage as well. And one struggle we're facing is just the, all the shipping issues. Um, mm -hmm. So we're going to a lot of different sources. So I guess one, if you have any recommendations for all these shipping issues where it could go from four weeks to eight weeks to three months without knowing with, with equipment. Um, and then two, I guess just general opinion about the different sources like web, web front store tends to be the least expensive, but there's not support and maybe they don't give you you don't need the hoses that you need with. There's just more support if you go through a bigger vendor like an Ed Don or a, a Washer Shram or something of that sort. Do you, what suggestions do you have? One around like the shipping issues that may be going on right now, and then also the different sources of getting this equipment. Um, if you're not going the the used route, which is that, it's super hard to find used stuff right now too. I found. Yeah. Um, let's say thank you COVID for all of this. Um, shipping right now is a nightmare for lots of reasons. One is the, the capacity's down, the costs have gone up, um, all the pain that we're feeling in our own operations, finding people, it's happening in every single industry. So, uh, you know, what used to be a six week to eight week lead time for mill work, it's now 14 to 18 weeks, if you're lucky. Um, I'm having a little addition built on my house and I ordered my door, uh, thinking I would have it in plenty of time. I ordered it in May. And it has not arrived. And I keep getting these nice little notes saying, yeah, you know, it'll be there eventually. I'm going to have an addition with no door on it. Um, and I live in upstate New York and it's going to be very chilly. Um, but this is something you can't really do much about other than to be as both proactive and flexible as you possibly can. Contingency isn't just money. It's also thinking. So have a plan B. Um, and this is hard for restaurants, right? Because you think I can't open if I don't have the equipment. What can you do? Um, where can you, what, what sorts of things can you do without having your full kitchen in place? Um, everybody's suffering the same way, Sean, and I'm sorry that you're experiencing this. Um, your comment about where to get stuff, um, my motto is cheap is for a reason. If something is a very low price, there's a reason for that. and when you find some vendors online, um, especially vendors that seem to advertise a great deal, um, I'm always a little suspicious when I see a price at some of those vendors that's way below what I know something should be. Because just as you pointed out, it may be that there's no service. There's, um, uh, I'll give you an example, I, a Hobart slicer, right? I'm gonna mention the brand Hobart. Um, Hobart's been around a long time. You can take a Hobart slicer and throw it off the back of a truck and it'll still work, right? Hobart stuff is very robust. If you order this from a food service equipment dealer, you know, one that is specializes in supporting restaurants and has a presence, you know, brick and mortar presence in your community, that, make, that slicer will show up with a cord and a plug so that you can actually plug it in and use it. If you buy it from an online vendor, that may not be the case. Um, so, cheap is for a reason. I would say, again, talk to restaurateurs about who they used and were they happy. And do not, do not look for the lowest price because you will probably be unhappy. I'm going to add a little piece to this, which isn't what you asked, but hopefully it'll help. When you are getting prices for anything, get it multiple prices, right? From contractors or architects or whatever, get multiple prices Throw out the low one, throw out the high one and work with what's in the middle. And by that, I mean, don't go with the cheapest, don't go with the most expensive, but get yourself a range and then go with what's in the middle because the low is always going to be a world of hurt. Awesome advice. Why did you do this when he mentioned? Uh, um, well, because our, our, share with us? <laughs> I, well, I, I don't want to be in a position of dissing a particular company. Okay, I don't, I don't, um, so uh, I, but online vendors can be a concern. So you have to do a lot more due diligence when you're using online vendors. And the, this that I'm talking about, she made the cross, the crosses with her fingers when Sean mentioned a couple of things, but uh, we won't mention, I, I agree with you. With not dissing yeah, online vendors, I, I'm, I'm, I always be very cautious and do your homework. I, I would encourage you instead to get to know the, the local food service equipment dealer in your community 
um, and just talk to them, but again, talk to other restaurateurs, who are they happy with? You're going to get much better advice. Do you have a list or do you know of a list of local uh, kitchen supply stores? I don't know of a list, but Google is very handy for these sorts of things. Because I think it'd be cool to have like a working list of referred or recommended geographically. Uh, I, I, love I know, but the forums often do. Um, if you go to restaurantowner.com the forums, um, you might be able to post a question. Just say, hey, I'm in Ithaca, New York. And, um, you know, who are some good dealers in, in within a 60 mile radius? And, you know, people... Yeah. But um, this is where, again, doing some due diligence and, you know, Google, find out who's around, um, asking local restaurateurs, invaluable. I think we have time for one more question. Wes, I see you with your hand up. We're coming back to you. All right. So starting out building this list, you know, like any other Excel spreadsheet on budgeting projections, it can feel daunting. What sections, categories should someone start with? to get the sort of a, a grasp on what they're looking at? I would start with the pre-opening expenses. And here's why, because those pre-opening expenses are going to be driven off of what you, your operating projections are going to be, right? How much personnel you need, what your food costs are, what your beverage costs are. Those are the early decisions you have to make. I would start with those. The things like construction budget and architects fees and building permit, until you have a pretty good handle on what your concept is, those numbers are very much in flux. And they're gonna wax and wane as you refine and refine and refine. But the staffing, you're gonna, okay, do I need, do I need a chef or am I gonna be the person working the line? Um, you're not gonna do it all by yourself, guaranteed. Do I need servers? Th these things will start making you think through your concept in more detail. And so I would really start with pre-opening expense and then use that to kind of start saying, okay, what kind of kitchen equipment am I going to need? How much space is that going to require? And then you can start building out the equipment part of the budget. And then that in turn will influence the construction budget, right? Um, because depending on what kind of equipment you have and the space you're going into, construction budget might be relatively low. Um, so that's kind of where I would start. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you for everybody who showed up here today. And thank you again for Stephanie for joining us three times in a row, uh, three weeks in a row for this awesome series of uh, business planning advice. You were an incredible guest. Uh, any final thoughts before we wrap things up? Take your time. Don't be daunted. It's This is a lot. You're doing a lot. It's okay. Take your time. Ask for help. Ask for advice be kind to people who you talk to. Yeah. And uh, you've been so great. Why don't you give us a little bit of a pitch and how we can connect with you and what you specialize in as far as the services you offer? Sure. Um, my area of expertise is the physical environment. So if uh, I'm no longer doing kitchen design, but the sorts of assistance I can provide to people is looking over what your designer's done and giving you feedback on it. Um, my also, I specialize, my, my, my PhD dissertation was on seating behavior in restaurants, crazy. So I focus on how to make your front of house the most profitable it can be, which can be everything from what your seating is to how you arrange the tables and what table mix you need to have. So I do consulting services for that kind of thing. Um, if you, those are the sorts of things you're interested in getting some assistance with, and you want to talk about some consulting, um, send me an email or contact Eric and he'll put you in touch with me too. Um, but, uh, those are the kinds of things that I specialize in. So I'm putting a little note here, sitting for profitability, another workshop on the list. Uh, you're always welcome back. I, I have it listed down here and keep in mind, Stephanie is also in the network. So, uh, join the network. She'll be in there. Uh, that's one way you can connect with her. If you're okay with that stuff, I shouldn't yeah. speak. Yeah, okay. I, I may not be there every day, uh, but I will definitely be sticking my head in from time to time as I'm doing stuff because it's really a pleasure to get to know you all. Um, and uh, anyone who is taking on what you're taking on, I admire and cheer you on with great enthusiasm. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you for all the great advice. And there is no questioning. You are unstoppable. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. I'll put that formula in the chat for you. Cheers.